Wonder if we could just raise our hands and sing real quietly, like, you know, softly, rather. Now I believe. Now I believe. Now I believe. You'll have to stick to that one there. All things uh, you'll find out how it was possible. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to Thee tonight humbly in the spirit of prayer and thanksgiving to offer to Thee the adoration of our hearts, praying that You will receive us as Thy children, forgiving us of all of our sins and healing us of all of our diseases, that Thy Word might be made manifest among us. If there would be some here who does not know Thee as their personal Savior, we pray, O Lord God, that this will be the night when they will become acquainted with Thee and know Thee as their dear and loving Savior, Father of their being. I pray tonight for all that sick and needy that Thy Holy Spirit may heal them tonight. Bring back, O Lord, the backslider that is strayed from the way. Remember those who are just about ready to fall from the way, that the feeble hands that once hung down be lifted up. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll speak to us tonight in an outstanding way through thy word, bringing the message of the hour to our hearts. Remember other meetings that's going on throughout the city and nation and around the world that Your servants may have power tonight to preach the Holy Spirit, the baptism, the coming. Give them signs and wonders to accompany their ministry that it might be known that we're living in the last days. May we prepare our hearts as we wait for his coming. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask it. Amen. May be seated. It's good tonight to be back in this, uh, an arena. Most everyone knows that this is where I first started uh, to meet in the public was in a boxing ring. When I was a young boy, I was fighting in golden gloves and then from that went into professional fighting and won 15 straight professional fights. Came to the Lord and finished my career of fighting the first night I met the Lord Jesus. That settled it. Last fight I had was in an arena at Evansville, Indiana with Billy Frick from Huntington, West Virginia. And now tonight I'm not fighting my brother. I have a new opponent, the devil. And I know you have to watch him because he hits low and fouls. All of his licks are like that. But I'm so glad that we have a referee, a real one, the Lord Jesus. He's the captain of our salvation. I pray tonight that God will give us the victory and will give us the... He has done evil, Satan has to the people, making them sick and afflicted and making them slaves to sin. But Jesus is here tonight to free us from all these things. Bless and help his loving children. To him we give praise forever and ever. Now, we got quite a little stay this time in Phoenix. And we're out here now in the, this Madison Square Garden. 
And if I've always had an ambition to preach the gospel at Madison Square Garden. It's finally arrived, and but I think on its journey from the north out here, it must have shrunk up a little bit. And I think the Madison Square Garden in New York seats about 20,000, 19,000 people. I've had many services, three outstanding services that... Um, at St. Nicholas Arena, that's where they do much of their wrestling and fighting. The Lord blessed us there, was packed out several times around seven, eight thousand for two or three nights that would be there. Usually that's the jumping board before going overseas. But as the days begin to count up with me and the American people are all out for youth today, as you begin to get just a little age. They look for the young man. There's something with glamour. It's just the trend of the nation. The boy, the kid. If a man was going to be operated on, he sure wouldn't want to get some little doctor who never had an operation before. He'd want to get an experienced doctor. It used to be in the days of Dwight Moody and so forth in the Bible times. It wasn't so. You didn't see the children preachers and so forth. They took a man who was aged and knew what he was talking about. They went through the great knocks. But today, America's all sold out for youth. Well, we got a, a judge in our state, I think 22 or 23 years old, a judge of a circuit court, 22 years old. They'll have a beatneck president after a while. It looks like it's a, they just the youth, they just take these kids, they take ev- over everything. But the coming of the Lord is at hand. That's my theme. That's what I believe. That's what I'm trying to get to the people, the coming of the Lord. Many of you might have wondered why that I haven't had healing services since I've been in Phoenix. That's for a purpose. And I believe that last evening when we were going home, I was talking to Billy, my son, and there were several come up at the altar out at the church where we were at the last three nights. And... I've seen those people at the altar weeping, and Billy said to me, he said, Dad, uh, when you want us to give out prayer cards, let us know. I said, I'll let you know. But I said, Billy, if there, I'll say at least ten centers or maybe more came up to the altar weeping. I said, I feel better over those ten centers coming, and I would have ten wheelchairs being emptied up, because that's lasting. Thing. I really appreciate Healing, anyone knows that. But I like to see that healing of the soul, which is so needed today. In the other lands over in Africa and Asia, and I've just come from overseas, going back again, the Lord willing, right away. And in there, divine healing is wonderful. It works miracles to the soul. America has been combed back and forth, back and forth, all kinds of divine healings. And therefore, the people should have faith to believe God for healing. But I come to Phoenix for fellowship. I come to Phoenix to, to fellowship with my brethren, to express and find what they have found in the Lord, tell them what I have found in the Lord, and have a little time down here where we're having blizzards and snows in Indiana, be down here a week or two, I'm in Tulsa. Then I guess from there over to Stuttgart, Germany, and on through Europe. But now, while we're here, this meeting, everybody's welcome. If you're a Protestant, Catholic, Jew, yellow, black, brown, white, no matter what your belief is, what your religious thoughts are, you're welcome. There'll be no difference. We're one in Christ Jesus. We are brethren, sisters, and that's the way we want to feel. And after a bit, I think that when we begin to see the sick coming in to be healed and uh, so forth, we'll be praying for the sick. I haven't had, there's no prayer cards been given out at all since I've been in Phoenix. Who has a prayer card? No one. We don't get, haven't given out. May not. We don't know. We want to follow the simplicity of the Holy Spirit. I found this as I get older. See, I just passed 25 a few months ago. That's the second time I passed. <laughs> and so I'm... Ah, that sounds old, doesn't it? 
Don't know how sound it is. But he renews my youth daily. I feel better than I did when I was past it the first time. I was just a young Baptist preacher then, and I thought I could, I was defender of the faith and had to tear up everything that wasn't Baptist. And so I found out that <laughs> other fellows had a little part of the cover too. You know, the cots just gets pretty narrow sometimes, so it, there's enough cover to cover us all up if we, that is the blood of Jesus Christ, if we'll just accept it that way. I'm wondering, I'm watching, uh, you wonder why I'm speaking. Watching around like this, I'm seeing uh, the audience how they seems like they don't hear so well. Can you hear around back under the back there? Can you hear all right? Just about one or two hands. What about back here? Can you hear all right? Way back. I didn't think you could. You can notice when you're saying things. That's the reason I was doing that to see what kind of an effect it would take. I wonder if there'd be some way. All right, the gentleman there is going to try to. Fix it so they can hear back around the sides. You can stand here and have a. If you've been praying and prayed up, you can watch the effects it has on the people when you say anything. And usually that's the way I find my text. Now I believe we got music with it. <laughs> Just. I haven't got a melodious voice. <laughs> I don't believe we could stand that much. But is it better? Back under the, back beneath, is it better? Over here, can you hear me better now? Good, that's fine. Well now, let us bow our heads now for a word of prayer and we'll start right into the service. And we're going to ask the Lord Jesus to bless his word that we read now. Our Heavenly Father, we come tonight to ask you to receive us as a people as your church and this building which is called here the Madison Square Garden of Phoenix. I pray thee, Heavenly Father, that you will sanctify this building, that the angels of God will move in. For we realize that it's not the building that we are in, it's the people in the building. Not the building that makes the church, it's the people inside the building. And I pray thee, Heavenly Father, that this, the purchase of thy blood tonight being gathered here, the people that will live forever in a world that is to come, and we've come here for the purpose of fellowshipping through the Holy Spirit and enjoying the Word of God as Brother David Duplissis, our teacher, and many others are bringing the word, and that the Holy Spirit might come and convince sinners of their wrong, and would bring his presence so near unto us that all the peoples would want to serve him. Grant it, Lord. And there's no man that's able to open the book or to loose the seals thereof, but there was a lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world. He come and took the book out of the hand of him that sat upon the throne, for he was worthy. O Lamb of God, come tonight in thy transforming power and take the words that we shall read and Reveal them to us in the power of the Spirit. When this service shall end tonight, may every unbeliever that's present become a believer. May those that are fallen from the way renew their vows. The sick be healed. And when we are on our way across the city in different places, may we say like those who came from Emmaus that day, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Then, Father, we would pray that you would do something outstanding tonight that would attract the attention of the people to thy word. Make thy word alive to us. We are able to read it. Who has enough education to read? We can read it, but we cannot make it live. It takes the Spirit the Holy Spirit to make the Word live. 
and may it live in every heart here tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. To you who are keeping record of the text that we read, I would ask you tonight to turn to the fourth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. The fourth chapter, and we will read the sixteenth and seventeenth verse for a, a reading. And the, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them that sat in the regions of the shadows of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Now for a text I wish to take the, la- the first three words of the 17th verse, from that time. You know, there's, we as people tonight can think back of certain times certain things began. There's no doubt in my mind, but what many people here can recall certain times that something happened, and you say, and from that time, things were changed. Like a child, he can say that I was a good child, a good obedient boy or girl, and One day I met up with a companion, and they persuaded me to to do a certain thing, and from that time, it started. How many times can we think of things like that that's happened in our life, and we mark it from that time? Then we can think of the immoral woman. She might say, as a girl, I was raised in a Christian home. I was brought up with good parent and good Christian teaching. And I was married to a fine Christian boy. And our home was beautiful. And we had two little children or so. And one day, I was down in the city and I run into a girlfriend that I used to live in the neighborhood with her and she persuaded me on a date. And from that time, my home has never been the same. It could be also that the drunk, the alcoholic, might say, I was raised in a home that did not believe in drinking alcoholic beverages. And I never drink in my life until one day such and such a thing happened. And from that time, Here a few years ago, I was on my road to South Africa, and I had to stay over two or three days in New York because I thought I could get by without having the yellow fever shot, but they just wouldn't let me board the plane. And I had to take the shot and wait for so many days, and I had a meeting, and there was a minister, Brother Berg, an outstanding, noted, full gospel minister of New York, which is, was a chaplain in the last war. And they have missions down on the Bowery, and he said to me, Brother Branham, how would you like to go with me tomorrow down on the Bowery? That's what we, just like Skid Row in Chicago. And I said, Brother Berg, I'd be happy to go with you to the Bowery. And we went down there, and 
my heart ached when I seen man laying on the streets that was in such a terrible condition, laying up against an automobile, and their clothes all soiled from the waist down, and, and not even knowing what they were doing, and some laying back in the alleys and cross each other just at the end of the road. We went into a mission, which the church sponsored, and the pastor, after meeting him, he said, we've taken 180 carts from this building in a year of those alcoholics that came into this mission and died here while service is going on or during the night. 180. And then I went out on the street and I thought, isn't there something can be done about it? And as we walked, I said, Brother Berg, I suppose all these man year was raised up in the slums and never had a chance. Oh, he said, you'd be surprised, Brother Branham. You should talk to some of them. And uh, I said, I would like to. He said, if we can find one that's not so far gone that we could speak to him, I'd like for you to talk. I said, all right. And a certain fellow we raised up. And he spoke to him, said, can you hear me? He said, give me a drink. I said, I'm a, a minister. I would like to know why that you would throw your life away like this. When I said minister, roused up and looked at me, and he said, excuse me, sir, for asking you for enough money to buy me a drink, but you don't know my case. I said, sir, I sympathize with you. My father drank. And he'd drink on until death took him. I'm not making you the worst person in the world, but I would like to know a man that's got enough decency about him to excuse himself when he sees that he's done wrong. How could you ever throw your life to this? He said, son, I can almost point my finger and show you with my eyes the bank that I was president of. And I said, sir, is that truth? He said, my name is such and such a name. You might go to the bank and see if that's right or not. I said, how did you come to do this? He said, I had Christian training. And I was once the member of the church. I said, well, what caused you to do this? said, one day I come home from work, I had a lovely family and a beautiful wife. He said, but I found what we call a dear John letter laying on the table. My wife had gone. And from that time, I tried to drown my sorrow with drinking. Oh, I said, I wish I could take you back to that time. That time, if he could only go back to that time. I talked to a young woman some time ago who was in the emergency room. She was from the psychopathic uh, great meeting at Flint, Michigan, and they had maybe 30 cases of insanity in the room, and they said you could not bring them out in public because they were in straight jackets and in all kinds of conditions. And I went into the room and one man went with me and when we went in there, there was a beautiful young woman looked to be about 20 or 25 years old sitting there. I said, how do you do? She said, how do you do? And I said, well, it's hard to know which way to start and some of them out of their minds and screaming and, and people watching them and she said, if you don't mind, sir, I'd like for you to start with me. I said, with you? She said, yes, sir. 
Well, I said, you're not a patient, are you? She said, yes, sir, I am. Well, I said, you seem to have your right mind. She said, I wonder. And she said, could you listen to my story just a moment? I said, certainly, madam. And she started telling me, she said, I was reared in a good home. She said, and my mother taught me not to do wrong, to shun evil, and to embrace the right thing. She said, and I lived that kind of a life for a number of years, and I got mixed up with a young man. And she said, it uh, caused a disgrace to me, and said, I just started and throwed myself away, and I become an alcoholic. Said, then they picked me up and sent me to a Catholic institution called the Good Shepherd's Home. Said, there I was under correction for a number of years, and then they released me. And as soon as I got out from that, I started drinking again. And said, then I served a year or two in woman's state prison. And said, then I had changed from Protestant to Catholic. Then, during this time, I changed back to Protestant again, from the chaplain talking to me. And said, I come out and try it again, but said, I went right back into it again, into prostitution, drinking. And I said, your mother, she's dead. Your father, dead. And I said... What do you think they would think about you now? She said, oh, if I could only go back again. I said, a lovely young woman like you, don't you desire to be married and have babies like all mothers do and so forth? She said, I would love to, sir. But look at me. What could I offer anyone? I said, you've got one thing you can offer. She said, what said? I said, your soul to Jesus Christ. She said, sir, he wouldn't receive it. I said, oh, yes, he will. She said, how do you know he would? I've tried. I said, yes, you're just turning pages. But you really come to him. She said, what could he do with me? I said, make a lady out of you. She said, not me. I'm too far gone. I said, he can take you back to the time. When you was a virgin, innocent girl, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient and powerful to transform the vile sinner to a blood-washed saint, guiltless before God. She said, I've tried that so many times. I said, I want to tell you, I believe your case has never been diagnosed right. I said, you don't want to be like that. She said, certainly not. I said, just what you mentioned a while ago is what I want to be. A mother with husband with babies. Someone to love and someone that loves me. But I'd never spoil a man's life like I am. I said, you don't have to. I said, this may sound old-fashioned, sister, but it's the truth nevertheless. It's the devil that's done that to you. It's the devil that's got a hold of you, driving you to things that you don't want to do. She looked at me with those big, dark eyes and said, I've always believed that was the truth. I said, would you kneel here with me? She said, now they tell me I'm... I'm a mental case. I said, you are. But I said, Jesus Christ restores the right mind. There's nothing too great for him. And she said, do you think he would for me? I said, certainly. But we've got to get that devil out of there before he can, before he entered when he was a young girl. He'll go out and you'll go right back to that place again. And she got down on her knees and I asked her to pray. And she prayed for a few moments. She looked over at me and she said, Brother Branham, I now am going to make a new start. I said, Sis, it won't do one bit of good. You're going just exactly the same road you've been over. 
It won't work. And she said, I, I mean it in my heart. I said, I know you do. But that devil's more stronger than any mental powers that you could put to him. That's the reason I don't believe in an intellectual religion. I believe a man's got to be born to give of the Holy Spirit. It's got to be deeper than your thinking. Got to be an experience. And she said, what must I do? I said, just stay right there. And we prayed and prayed. I went ahead and prayed with some more people and come back. She was praying. I come back to her again and after a while I come back and she was getting deeply in sincerity. In a few moments she raised up with tears running down her cheeks. She looked me in the face. She said, Brother Branham, something's happened. I said, you don't have to turn no new pages now. The woman's married and got a family and a lovely, sweet, born-again, Holy Spirit-filled saint. Because God could take her back to a place where she started to do wrong. That's his goodness. And from that time, she was a changed woman. From the time of a young girl to one time, she was evil. God take her back, and from that time, she was different. Those things of turning new pages, that's good. We think that's very good. It's like after the First World War, many of you men and women can remember that perhaps. I was a little boy of about eight or nine years old. I remember well of even ministers saying, War is over. We'll never have no more wars. It's all settled now. We just can't have no more wars because we got poison gases and so forth. Many of you remember that. The nation told us, wars are settled for good. They meant that. From that time, they said there'll be no more war. But we had them just the same. When they begin to see rumors rising up, nation turning against nation, they formed what was known as the League of Nations to police the nations. They tried that. See, that was mental, but it did not work. It thrown us right into one of the greatest wars we ever had after that. Now, they've got what they call the UN. Police the nations again, but it will fail just as sure as two twos are four. It's got to fail. They think it's good, which it is, but as long as mental thinking, it doesn't do it. It takes revelation. Spiritual revelation. All those things, as good as they may be, trying to join church, that's good. I think everyone ought to join church. That's good as far as it goes. But that's not the cure. I think that everyone ought to take their choice as American citizens to join any church that they want to. And I think that we ought not to disfellowship that person upon their convictions. I think we should all fellowship with one another, asking God's mercies on us all. But that's not the thing yet. Every New Year's, man will make a pledge, go out and write on a book, maybe on the Bible sheet, and say, I'll never drink again, I'll never smoke again, I'll never be untrue to my wife again. And less than five or ten days, they broke every vow they made. See, they're making it by mental conception. That's why many people join churches, because they fear hell. And they come and put their names on books and go out and think it settles it, but it doesn't. It's not lasting. All those things are temporal. But there is a time when a certain thing can happen, and from then on it's different, really different. That's when man meets God. Things change when man meets God. A man can never meet God and ever be the same again. You will either be a better person or a worse person. You'll be better off or worse off after you meet God. It depends on what you want to do about it. 
But a man can never meet God and ever be the same. Whatever your attitude is towards God seals your eternal destination. You can walk across the line between grace, mercy, and judgment. And when you spurn grace so many times, you can separate yourself from ever from the presence of God. Or you can accept Him and have eternal life and never die but be raised up again at the last day in the gentle resurrection. Oh, how glad I am that there's something that we can point back to and say from that time something happened. Let's take some man that met God, that changed their destination and the destination of their, their generation. Let's take, for instance, Abraham. He was just an ordinary man. He was not a saint. He was just a man. And oh, I'm so glad that we don't have to be born in a certain line or, or be some great somebody. We just have to be humble. God's grace is what does the work. Abraham, just a man, down perhaps in the bushes one day in the valleys of the Shinar Valley in the out of the city of Ur, wandering about out in the bush maybe with his sheep or so forth, and God met him and spoke to him and blessed him. I believe that a man comes to God and ever has a definite experience. Or maybe you think I'm beside myself. But look, I don't mean an impersonation of an experience. We've got so much of that today till it makes a real Christian sick to look at it. Somebody trying to impersonate somebody else. God has never made two the same. He never did and he never will. God's a God of variety. He makes big hills and little hills and deserts and, and swamp lands and what more. He's a God of variety. Don't try to impersonate anyone else. Be what you are, what God made you. Abraham, God spoke to him and he had a definite experience and it changed his life. And the strange thing is, when a man meets God, he can never be the same and can always point back to that time when he met him. God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham acted different. And every time a man meets God from that time on, he'll act different. If he rejects God, he'll be an infidel, right? Or he'll be an impersonator or a hypocrite. Or he'll be a godly, sainted person that'll walk different, talk different, live different, act different. Peculiar, odd, led of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something, is my brother and sister. I am never, and ne God help me to never be, to ever try to be somebody. That's when you're nothing. Twist myself in such great big things till I have to have thousands of dollars a night to sponsor some program. Let me be just Brother Branham. Let me be just what God would make me to be. No matter what it is, if it's to eat soda crackers and drink Greenwich water, wear overhauls, whatever it is, let me be what God would have me to be. Never try to be something that you're not. Abraham, he was different from the time God met him. And look, Sometimes when God meets a man, it looked like Abraham could have had the world in his hand. The apostles with great powers could have had the world in their hands, as it was to say. Could have spread fame everywhere, but that kind of fame soon dies. The only lasting fame is when your name is wrote on the Lamb's Book of Life. That's when fame is real fame. This earthly thing so decays. Now look at Abraham. 
God told him to believe and accept the miracle that had not yet happened and was impossible only with God for it to happen. That was to believe that he is going to have a baby by Sarah. And he believed God and called anything contrary to it as though it was not. Abraham, from the time he met God, he was a changed man. Moses was an intellectual giant. He had all the wisdom of the Egyptians that he could teach their teachers. He was intellectual as he could be, smarter, far smarter than our most brilliant man today, because the Egyptians had things that we don't have today. They could build a pyramid, we could not. They could embalm a body and make it look natural for hundreds and hundreds of years. Seventy-two hours is our limit. They could put dying clothes that would never fade out. We cannot do that. Many things that they had, dig up things that they had that we could not, we could not do the same today. They were way smarter, more intelligent. And Moses could teach them. But all of his intellectuals, he had never met God. Oh, I'd like to see the preachers in here just a minute. Do you see, brethren, my Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, whoever you may be, you can have a call of God on your life. You can know that you're called to the ministry, but you have no right to preach the gospel until you've had an experience with God of being born again. Jesus told the disciples, you wait in the city of Jerusalem until you're due with power from on high. Moses could not go down and deliver the children of Israel until first he met God face to face and talked to him. Why? Moses could say, I was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. But one day I was herding my father-in-law's sheep at the backside of the desert. And I seen a bush burning. And from that time, he was a different man. He didn't rely upon his intellectuals. He was running from Egypt where God had called him. But as soon as he met God, he took a mule and his wife and his son and a little old crooked stick and went down to Egypt. Why, he had met God. And from that time, he was changed. There was something different. His intellectuals were lost. He didn't think about the danger. Why, he had met God and could point back to that time. No man has a right to preach the gospel. No person has a right to call themselves a Christian until they can go back to a certain time in their life where they can come on that sacred sands at the backside of the desert where they know that they have met God. All the infidels in the world, and these intellectual giants taking the Bible and explaining away all the days of miracles, their past. There's no such a thing as divine healing. All this stuff like speaking with tongues, interpretation of tongues, and gifts of healing, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they can slickly and take your mind and twist you in such a way until they can take that away from your memory. They can explain it away. I want you to get this, and don't you never let it pass from you. But if a man's ever stood on that sacred sands at the back side of the desert when he meets God face to face, there's not enough devils in all hells to take that away from him. He knows he met God. Hallelujah. He knows he had an experience. He talked to God. Regardless of what the opposition is, he can say, from that time, something changed in me. How well I can call the time. And a little old saloon that was being used as a church where some colored people was preaching the gospel. I was a southerner and didn't like colored people. And a vision came and told me where to go find it. And all the white girls that I went with, oh, not all of them, four or five standing there, said, Billy, you're not going in there there. I said, yes, I've got to go. So don't ever ask me for another date. It didn't make any difference. I met God, and from that time I've been changed. I can point back to that time I was changed. No man has a right to forfeit until he's got an experience. No matter what the intellectuals can say, you know you met God. 
Why, intellectual knowledge would have told Moses to walk into his own death. But he knew he had met God, and God was God. And God's still God. It's the reason I'm so glad I can stand here in this arena tonight. Give Satan an uppercut that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And can prove it by his Holy Spirit here now. He ever remains the same. Not altogether with the Word. The Word only points the way. But the Holy Spirit declares it that he's the same. And for his blessings and his, his promises, we can say from that time, something happened. Mary was just an ordinary girl, a good girl, a virgin. I'm going to say she was 16 or 18 years old, engaged to a man, Joseph. Now, she was just an ordinary girl. She loved God. She believed in God. But one day on her way to the well to get some water, she met God. And from that time, the world has hailed her. Blessed art thou among women. Why? Not because she was a virgin. Thousands of virgins. Millions. We still have virgins, but we can only have one Mary. She can point her finger from that time. From that time. From that trip to the well. Oh, God, take us tonight to the wells of water. You're not a believer that we can say from that time at Madison Square Garden, Phoenix, Arizona, from that time, something took a hold of me. I had an experience. Doubts fell away from that time. That time. Sure, it was from that time. Paul, a persecutor of the church, Oh, that little hook-nosed Jew. Show the power of decision of the church. They had the keys. That's true. I watch how they made their decision. Talking about what the church can do. The church has only got one key. That's prayer. The church doesn't save you. You're a member of the church by birth. But the church doesn't save you. It's Christ that saves you. It's not coming in contact with the church. It's coming in contact with Christ. And then automatically you're in the church. The church had the keys. Jesus told them he gave them the keys. Look how they used it. They said, now it's written in the scriptures. The scripture must be fulfilled. That let another take his bishopric, talking of Judas. And he said, let's choose one that has been in, out among us. And they had two. They find fine cultured man, good man, just as religious as they could be to the key. Man that were good reputation, and they cast their lots and chose Mathenus, but what good did it do? There isn't one thing recorded in the Bible that it, they ever did. Not one thing, just a good old deacon or something another like, but he's supposed to be an apostle. God went over and chose a little old high tempered hook nosed church hater. It shows that God can take nothing and make something out of it. That's what makes him God. That's the reason I join myself tonight in the people that they, in this world is called holy rollers. People of life not way up in some great bracket, but men and women who's been in the gutters, been in sin, been kicked out, taken away from the things of the world, but met God face to face, and God has made saints out of them. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound. God does it that way. They can point back and say, yes, I was no good. I took the name of the Lord in vain. I did this. I smoked. I drank. I was this way or that way. But from that time, one time when I met God, things change. No more drinking. No more things of the world. I'd pass from death unto life. And from that time, I become a new creature in Christ. Paul, church hater. Saint hater, very religious, high tempered, persecuting the church, sassy, but a very intellectual man. God said, I'll just choose him. Now, today, half the church would deny him. And God tucked him down on his road to Damascus. 
Now come the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel before him and blinded him and made him fall to the earth. He took that man, and Paul could say this, One time I was a religious Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I had good intellectual back trainings. But all of my education and all my intellectuals, I had to forget to know Christ. How did you do it, Paul? I was on my road to Damascus to arrest those people, and a light shined from the heavens and struck me blind. And from that time, amen. From that time, he was a changed man. Peter the fisherman would have likewise. How about blind Barnabas? That laid at the gate as we talked of last night. The blind man could say, I was blind until I come in contact with God. And from that time I could see. Oh yes, if you're spiritual blind... Come in contact with him, and from that time, you can see. Everything that comes in contact with God is changed. The leper one time come in contact with God, and he was changed. From a leper to a well man. There was an immoral woman one time met Jesus at the well. She was full of sin. Her heart was heavy. Her burdens were too much to bear. Her society had kicked her out. She stood there and seen just an ordinary Jew. A fellow kind of aged for his, looking age for his age. I think the scripture claims that he looked to be 50 when he was only 30. And he said, you're a man yet not over 50 years old and say you have seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. (laughs) So he was only 30 or 32 years old. And a young, beautiful woman come up one day to the well where he was sitting tired. And he said to her, woman, bring me a drink. And she said, it's not customary for you to ask me such things. Is that I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. Segregation. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, what was that woman doing? She is meeting God. She met a man, but it wasn't the man that she was meeting. It was God in the man she was meeting. God let that soak in. The scripture said you've entertained angels not knowing what you were doing. Unaware of it. Same as Abraham entertained angels. And immediately after the angel left and had performed a miracle before him, he called the man God, Elohim. The almighty God sitting there eating steak sandwiches, drinking milk from the cow, eating cakes. And he was almighty God. The woman, little did she know. Look what it done for Abraham then. It changed him and Sarah from an old man and an old woman of a hundred years old back to a young man and woman that brought forth Isaac. They met God. That's what done the difference. This immoral woman, she met Jesus and she spoke to him. Watch how he made himself known. He said, woman, go get your husband and come here. She said, I do not have any husband. He said, you've said well. For you've had five husbands, and the one you're now living with is not your husband. You've said, well. And from that time, she was changed. Oh, what a difference. That Jesus, when she met him there, looked like a man. And when I could imagine seeing those big, pretty eyes, tears coming out of them, she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. But who are you? Jesus said, I'm he that speaks to you. And from that time, from that time, he had a message to tell the world, come see a man who told me the things that I've done. The Messiah is on the earth. She stirred her city. A few hours before that, the city would have laughed at her. She couldn't even come to the well with the rest of the women. What happened? What made the man listen to her? If you ever been in the Orient, they wouldn't listen to a woman like that. Some Oriental brother was trying to tell me, he said the woman wasn't a prostitute. Because the man wouldn't listen, listen to her. I said, but brother, you failed to see that she had met Christ. That's what made the difference. 
I don't care. You could have been a drunkard. You could have been a prostitute. You could have been anything that you wanted to be. But when you meet Christ, from there on it's different. God's able these stones to rise. So from that time on, she had a message that she had met the Messiah because she seen the sign of the Messiah. She knew that that was He. Or she said herself, We know when Messiah cometh, He'll tell us these things. But who are you? Jesus said, I'm He. And she dropped the water pot and away she went. If she just stand on the platform tonight, she'd say, I was foul and immoral. But I had read in the Bible where he used to be a God prophet. When this man told me he looked like a, just a man, but when he told me in my life, I knew that that was the sign of the Messiah. So a prophet has a potion of the Messiah's spirit. So I said, sir, you must be a prophet. We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said, I'm he that speaks to you. She knew that if a man who could do that would say what he was, it was right because God was backing it up. Glory. Oh, can you get it? Do you know what I'm speaking of? When God promised to send the Holy Spirit in the last days, then he's done it. We know it. He backs up his word. This, what we have tonight of the blessing of the Holy Spirit proves in a man's life if he's not impersonating something, if he's not trying to act like something, trying to act like something that he isn't, if he really is, God backs up his word with the person. To the woman that was once ill-famed, smoked cigarettes, drank, prostitute, if that woman claims that she met God and still in the same things, I doubt her word. If a man tells me that he met God and I don't believe there is such a thing as divine healing, I doubt his experience. Because God can't lie about his own word. If the Holy Spirit wrote the word, when he comes in, it'll say amen to every word God wrote. A man says he don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I doubt him ever meeting God. He might be called, he might be intellectual, he might be a great man, he might be an auditor, an intellectual, or, or an auditor of some sort, but he's never met God. The Holy Spirit of God in a man will speak amen to every word God says. He can say, I once did not believe in divine healing, but one day I met God, and from then, from that time, it changed me. There's something coming into me that transformed me and given an experience. I've never been able to forget it. Nothing to meet God without being changed some way. Oh, Judas met God. Yes, once he was a man, walked around the street. But after meeting God and becoming a betrayer, he became a devil. Many times we find that. You're not the same. But everything that comes into contact with God is changed. Now listen. One day, don't fail to get this. Oh, God. One day, death come in contact with God. Death come in contact with God. The devil never could hardly believe that that was the Son of God, or God made manifest. He believed he was a man, just an ordinary man. He couldn't see that God having a son. So you remember up on the mount that day when he met him? He said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. If thou be. A little bit of doubt. Let me see you perform a miracle so I could believe you. If thou be. So he had that if, if, if. Until one day, when he seen him defeated, thought he was defeated. Here he was, spit all over his face, his face bleeding, where he jerked handfuls of beard out, spit in his face, put a rag around his head, around his eyes, tuck a stick and hit him on top of the head. It said, now, if you be a prophet, tell us who hit you. You could discern the thoughts of their heart and... And you could tell the woman, my blood issue has stopped and all these things. Now, if you be a prophet, tell us who hit you. See the devil's agents working there? Jesus never opened his mouth. He did what the Father said to do, and that was all. And then they nailed him up on the cross, and he said, Now, if you be the Son of God, come down! He could have done it. But if he listened to the devil, he could have done it. But on his road up there, I'd imagine there was... A decision when the devil looked down, death. And he says, if that is life, then I'm ruined. But if it isn't life, 
I'll sting him. I'll kill him under at the cross. And at the conference in hell, the devil's angel was sent forth, the angel of death. And Jesus is going up Mount Calvary, dragging the cross behind him. Oh, it looked like it was defeated. It's so simple. Catch this. Many times God's program is so simple that it goes all the way over the head of people. Look like, if you just say, well, I look like we could have her do this or do that. Don't look at it at all. Just obey the Holy Spirit. No matter what he says, you do it. Here was God manifested in flesh, going up Calvary, bleeding, blood dragging out behind him over the cross, dragging out his footprints. God. The devil said God couldn't do a thing like that. Well, look at there. How could God be manifested in him? Defeated. Look at the mockery spit on his face. wonder if we as Christians could do that. Can you go the second mile? Can you turn the cheek the other side? That's the way to test Christianity. See how far you can go in love, and fellowship, and brotherhood. That's how you test Christianity. You can say, from that time on, I know I was changed. When you can do that. Could that be God? Could that be God's Son going there, Jehovah made manifest in flesh, going up there with handfuls of beard pulled out of his face? Why, no one could stand that. Mockery spit in his face. My agent smote him on the head and said, Now, if you be a prophet, you got some kind of a makeup work. You, you got some way of hope you put on the people. Now, if you be a real prophet, tell us who hits you and we'll believe you. Ah, he couldn't be God. Here he goes on up. And when he gets up there on the cross, they nail him to the cross. And the devil said, I got him now. After a while, weakness began to set in from loss of blood. What was it? The bee of death was buzzing around him, fixing to sting him. That bee of death coming around him and saying, oh, I doubt that. How could he be virgin born? How could God dwell like that great Jehovah God who has all powers in the heavens and earth? Let somebody spit in his face and take him on like that. He couldn't be. I'll suck the stinger into him. Brother, he didn't know what he'd done. When he put his stinger into that flesh, it took his stinger out. When a bee once stings, deeply it loses its stinger. A honeybee, insect that's got a stinger, when it stings, the flesh anchors and pulls the stinger out. And when death met God, Death lost its stinger. Now death has no stinger. It can buzz and make a noise and say, I'll take you, I'll kill you, I'll do this, that, the other. But it has no stinger. It lost it down in Calvary. No wonder Paul could say when he coming down to the end of the road, Oh, death, where is your stinger? Oh, grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How that from that time... Death has no stinger for the believer. Christ took the sting of death out for the believer. There's where he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement our peace upon him with his stripes. We were healed from that time. Satan was stripped of everything that he had. He's nothing but a bluff. Death is just a bluff. It has no stinger. I'll help the hands of saints when I'm looking up towards heaven and say, Oh, Brother Branham, can't you see him standing there? Sure, it has no stinger. I helped my own wife's hand when she looked into the glory. She said, Billy, don't you never fail to preach this wonderful gospel? Oh, it's the most glorious thing. She said, I never desire to stay here any longer. Twenty-two years old, leaving two children. I said, I'll meet you in the morning by the side of the gate, honey. I said, as long as I live and God's grace helps me, I'll stay on the field preaching this gospel. See, from that time, I was a changed man. From that time, you can meet God here right now and say, from this time on, you can be a changed person. You believe that? And from that time, let it be here tonight. If you've never tasted of the waters of life, may you taste them now while we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Just before praying, I'd like to ask this question. If you be just quiet as you can be for a moment, how many in here can never point their finger to a spot where that you can say from that time, I received the Holy Spirit and I was made a new person. I have never come to that sacred grounds, Brother Branham, where I was, can really be sure that I was born again. Will you raise your hand? Say, pray for me. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. God bless you over here. Over here. God bless you. 
all around. Somewhere else, over to my right now, say, Brother Branham, pray for me. I've never met that place, although I belong to church, but I've never had that time where I could say from this time, from that time, it was always settled. Brother Branham, I got an awful temper. I smoke, I drink or something. I, I, I just can't live true to my wife, my husband. I've, I've got an awful habit. I have never met God in such a place that I, I, I could say from that time all things of sin died. I would like to. Will you pray for me? Just raise your hand and I'll certainly do it. God will include you. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you down here. All right. Someone else just before prayer that hasn't raised her hand. Which, God bless you, the Spanish brother. God bless you, the Spanish sister. Oh, my. That's it, friend. Heavenly Father, they raise their hands. You know their hearts. I may never in this life be able to shake their hand, but sometime across the border, yonder, maybe before morning, but sometime I'm going to have to meet them. And I know when I appear there, if it's by thy mercy that I should stand with the redeemed, I'll either have to be a judge against these people or a judge for them, or the saints shall judge the earth. When all them in my generation that rises up from Phoenix in that day, if by your grace I'll be there, then I'll have to say I was in Phoenix, I preached in your generation. I never knew you, Jesus said. I never seen your hand go up. I never seen you offer one thing. You stayed from the meetings. You heard about it and you didn't come. I called you and you refused to go. Oh, God, what more can I say? Because the Holy Spirit is the true judge. And there will be those, Lord, here tonight who has raised up their hands. And they say they've never had that experience. And they want to get a place to where they can say from this time. From this time, they met God and had an experience that's changed their life. Heavenly Father, grant it tonight that each one that raised their hand, that this very night will not pass until they fall upon that sacred sand where God will speak to them definitely and so definitely by the Holy Spirit that all their sins and desires of sin shall pass away. All their habits shall go away and be no more. Grant it, Father, that they might say, it was at a years to come if the world stands and Jesus tarries and they remain. It was from that time at Madison Square Garden, on that night that I heard that message, from that time I was changed. Granted, Lord, I present them to you as trophies of the meeting in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't even know where these rooms here for an altar call. Is there a brother? There certainly is. Anyone here that doesn't know the Savior, now I'm just going to ask you to stay just about two, by five more minutes. Is there anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior? You've got sin in your life that's beset you, and you'd like to come here and, and accept Christ as your Savior. Would you come now, as I asked you? I know you say, Brother Branham, now give me your undivided attention just a moment. We'll be dismissing in a few moments, but don't leave right now. While the Holy Spirit has a hold on the people, from this time, make it now, friend. I'm your brother. I don't come to Phoenix here just to, because there's no other place to go. I, I don't come to Phoenix for no other purpose but God's love in my heart, that I love you. And according to the Scriptures, we'll have to stand at the Day of Judgment and be a, either a witness for you or a witness against you. And what will, if I would be privileged to stand there as a minister, if God lets me in, and I'll stand there as a messenger of this day. Remember, the Bible said, and the queen of the south shall rise in the day of judgment and condemn this generation. What are we going to do when, when I've come to you? You remember a few years ago when I come preaching to you? Many of you here remember. You remember how the sick was healed and people was even brought back from the dead? That's right. I would just pray for people then, would take them by the hand, and the Lord would, I wouldn't say nothing, but just wait and see what he'd say to be right. I told you there was coming a day, and that day would be when he would fulfill his ministry, his fulfill his word, and would say this, that the works that I do shall you also. He gave a sign, said as it was in the days of Sodom. Now watch, he, he told what they were doing in the days of Noah. You notice about Sodom, how he left that? 
That's for the spiritual mind to catch. Look, there was a modern Billy Graham, intellectual, went out into Sodom and preached the gospel and blinded the unbeliever. Is that right? But now there's always three classes. That's the unbeliever, make-believer, and the believer. That's, that's in every meeting, every place, everywhere. That is the ungodly, the church natural intellectual, and the church spiritual called out. Now, the word church means called out. These, here, the intellectual was called out of this. And these were called out of that, which is the bride, and this is a remnant of the woman's seed. If you could got spiritual mind, can understand. You ministers especially, if you can understand. I know you do. Now, watch what sign was done. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom. Now, there was three messengers come down for the three different classes of people. Two of them went down and preached the gospel in Sodom and brought out that little group that would come out. But watch the messenger that stayed with the church spiritual, Abraham and his group. Now listen closely. Don't forget it in the oncoming meetings. Now what's taking place? This man that was sitting there talking to Abraham, a man was sitting there eating the flesh of a calf, drinking the milk from a cow, and eating bread that Sarah had baked on the hearth. He said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? If he was a stranger, how did he know he had a wife and how did he know her name was Sarah? Now watch what the scripture said. Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. Sarah, back behind the little tents in the big tent, the flap closed down, no doubt. He said, Abraham, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life and what he's going to do. And Sarah, inside the tent behind the angel, laughed within herself. How many knows that's a scripture? And what did this angel say? Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she laugh? Now, Jesus said that same thing would take place just at the closing of the Gentiles. For he did it himself when he was here. He was dead in the days of Sodom. Now, watch, he never mentioned about the flood time, because it isn't going to be a flood, it's going to be fire this time. This world will be blown to pieces after a while. Maybe before morning, maybe before the year's out. Hydrogen powers will blow this thing to bits. It'll turn back to volcanic ashes again. It's true. That's exactly what the Scripture says. It won't come like that, them rims of gases up there, because it'll fall from above. Man destroys himself. But the last message of the angel to the church is here, and it's so simple, it's gone plumb over the head of the church and they fail to see it. Exactly. My brother and sister, in Christ's name I persuade you, don't let the hour pass. Don't sit when you raise your hands. Rush to the altar. Do something. Press in. Don't the Bible say there come a time when it's all slumbering and sleeping just before the coming of the Lord? People are unconcerned, just exactly like it was in the days of Sodom, just exactly like it was in the days of Noah, scoffers, fun makers. The angel of the Lord is here, and the last sign that he promised to give the church is now appearing amongst the people, and they don't recognize it. How did that little old woman down there recognize? When Jesus, when Philip come to him after he found Nathaniel and come to him, he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. He said, you're the Son of God. What did those Pharisees stand there? Religious, good people, church members, fine people. They said, in their hearts, in their hearts, not with their lips. They said, this man is a spiritualist, a fortune teller, Beelzebub. He does that by the prince of the devil, Beelzebub. Jesus perceived their thoughts. Is that right? He said, you speak that against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven you. The atonement hadn't been made. But so many words, so that you'll understand it, someday the Holy Ghost will come. In this last days, after 2,000 years of teaching on it, said the Holy Ghost will come, and one word against it will never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. See that? Watch that woman at the well. When he said, what's Peter? Ignorant. Couldn't even sign his own name. Ignorant and unlearned, the Bible said. And when Jesus saw him, he said, Your name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. He fell at his feet. 
become the head of the church at Jerusalem. An ignorant and unlearned man because he recognized the hour that he is living. The Samaritan woman, when he said, go get your husband, he said, well, I have no husband, said, told her about her condition. And she said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. She honored it, not the man, the message. She said, I perceive you're a prophet. We know that the sign of the Messiah will be that. Now, how many knows that's true? When Messiah cometh, he'll do these things, which is called the Christ. When he comes, he'll do these things, but who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she was changed. That same Jesus lives tonight. Do you believe that? How many in here believe that? Raise up your hand. Just say, I actually believe that. God bless your hearts. Thank the Lord. Oh, God, send mercy. Do you believe he's here now? How many of you are sick or needy? Raise your hand. Please. Anybody that knows me, don't raise your hands. I don't want you if you, raise, you know me. This people that knows that I don't know what your trouble is, raise your hand. Knows that I don't know your trouble. All right. You that have a request, ask God. Here it is. Now, many of you people think that it's mental telepathy. I've felt it here at Phoenix so many times because you've had everything in the country storming in on you here. Think it's somebody hands somebody a prayer card and by mental telepathy they transfer it. Oh, how far can a person get? Well, it's just that same spirit that lived back in them days. There's no prayer cards here. There's nothing here but the Holy Spirit. He's here. Tonight, before we've ever had a healing service, before there's been a prayer card, give out. I don't say this and God knows that my Bible in hand to him. I don't say this to be smart, to be different. But for the kingdom of God's sake, that Phoenix might always remember that the message that I preach to him is a truth from God's word and God's spirit here to back up every word that I've said. If he does it, then I've told the truth. A man getting up from a wheelchair, that could be mental healing. You know that. That could be mental healing. It would be impossible, you talk of a miracle, for something to happen here for the Holy Spirit to go among these people who I don't know and reveal something that they ought to do or something about them. Why, it would be a million times greater miracle. For we even know by doctor's records that many times hundreds of people that's been in wheelchairs for years get up and walk away and things like that. Sure, mental healing. Christian science has it. But when it comes to a real miracle, it goes over the head of people who are supposed to be spiritual. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take every spirit in here under the power of the Holy Ghost. You, I challenge you tonight. I don't know how many trips I'll ever make to Phoenix. This may be it. I don't know. I may come a hundred times more. I hope so. But I may not live any longer. You may not live. There's been many that's gone since I was here the last time. If I'll come back next year, there'll still be some here tonight won't be here. I may not be here myself, but God will always be. Let he who is the Holy Spirit prove now that I've said the truth. Now be real reverent, if you will, for just a moment. Give me your undivided attention, but pray. All I ask you to do is pray. I cannot say, let me have you. I have to watch for the Holy Spirit. Now, be real reverent. This is something after preaching like this, and, and I haven't even been out praying no more just studying the Bible for the message. But I believe God. He told me that. I'll even turn my back to you if you want to see if it's a, this, not me. Now, I'm a man. But the promise of God, it's the age, it's the hour. Don't you fail to see it. Now, you, brother. You're, I'm going to let the audience be behind me. The Bible said that the angel of the Lord had his back turned. Now, you know what I'm telling you. It isn't me. I have nothing to do with it. It's the angel of the Lord. How many of you understand that? Amen. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But God has to work through somebody. Man is God's agent. I see a man here talking to the deaf and dumb. Of course, they realize and understand. I can see them. I don't mean something. It's a miracle. 
Not say that man's deaf and dumb. Or, the Lord says to me, is somebody in here got kidney trouble? Yes, but who is it? Who are they? Where they come from? What caused it? How did they get well? That's it. We don't want psychology. We want truth. Amen. God's Bible, the truth. Yes. May the God of heaven, who will honor his word, grant tonight that my hands will be free. The blood of no man upon me. I've told the truth, Lord, as far as I know it. You help me that the people might know that the message is true. To Jesus' name, O God, somewhere in this building, the unseen one, make yourself known, Lord, if I can find grace in your sight. Forgive me of all my trespasses and use me tonight, Lord, if you want to bring this place and this elect out of the city tonight that's come to the meeting, that you might confirm it, Lord, to the truth that I've told the truth to them. Let it be known that you're Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and your power is the same. And you sent me for this purpose, I pray in Christ's name. I just want you to pray. Now you may raise your hand. This woman's sitting here. Now, if you, I pray that God will let you see this. Can you see that light that's hanging over this woman sitting right here at the end? Right here at the end, a little heavy set woman. Got her hands up. I believe you raised your hand a while ago, but I know nothing about you. So if, if God can reveal to me what, what you're there for, you might not want nothing. I cannot tell you. But if he'll reveal to me what you're there for, or something that's in your life, something that's in your heart, something that you've done or something you ought not have done, would you believe me to be his servant that hits his spirit? Would you believe that, lady? You know with your hand up, I don't know nothing about you as far as your life or things. You might have seen me and I might have seen you because I've been to Phoenix lots of times. But I, I don't know you. That's one thing I do not know. That's true. I don't know one thing about you. But if the Lord would reveal to me something, then that you've caught this, the Holy Spirit there. Now, I, you, this girl might say, show me, I can't do it. It's her. It's the woman that touched his garment that he turned to he said, I do nothing until the Father shows me, St. John 5, 19. But that light's hanging over the woman. I'm looking right at it. And if, it, if that light be the same light that followed the children of Israel, when it was here on earth, it was made manifest in a body of flesh called the Son of God. That was Jehovah in the light. Jehovah was manifested or tabernacled in his Son, which was the creative Son, Jesus Christ. He said, I come from God and I go to God. A little after that... Paul was on his road down after his death, burial, and resurrection, was on his road to Damascus, and that same light blinded him. He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Now, please, I ask you, don't, don't move around. Please don't. You broke that then. No matter how hard you try, preach, talk, beg, persuade, America's the worst place in the world to have an eating at this time. I've went to the hot and top land where 500,000 sat to listen to the meeting. Not even one move would come. This intellectual world, is, this in the United States is doomed to hell as certain as I'm standing in this pulpit. There's not one hope for this nation. Mark it in your Bible. See if I'm right or wrong. If I be God's prophet, he'll manifest it now. Who, are, who was that woman somewhere? Was it this one over there? All right. It's gone from you now, sister. I don't see it, but may he reveal it. Let not their sin be yours. Yes, there it is again. The woman's praying for a condition. She has a condition in her body. She's had a surgery. That was a gallbladder operation. And now she's caused some kind of a condition. She's vomiting all, got a vomiting. It's kind of a nervous condition in the stomach. It's caused her to vomit. But she's, uh, she's also praying for somebody else. And that's a man. A brother-in-law, I believe. That's right. And he's got stomach trouble. And he's shattered all over darkness. He's a sinner. That's what it is. He's a sinner. Those things are true. Is that right? All right. Do you believe now with all your heart? Then may you receive that which you've asked for. May you find it just the way that you've asked for. Thank you. God bless you. Thank How about someone else up in here somewhere, way back? 
anywhere you are, pray. Somebody doesn't know me. You do this. You say, Lord God, that man doesn't know me or know nothing about me. Let it be known tonight. Let me know it, Lord. All the people that know me will know. That's the way to do it. See if it's true. Just pray. Your husband wants healing, too. <laughs> Sitting right back there. Believe with all your heart that growth will leave. That's true. I need it either you or your husband. Here's a woman sitting right through here. She's kind of a middle-aged woman, sitting right out here looking at me, kind of green. She's praying for a friend of hers. That friend has a bad cold. That is right, isn't it, lady? And they take care of, it's like crippled children or something like that. They pray or, or take care of. Do you believe with all your heart to be healed? Do you? If you believe it, they will receive it. If you will believe it. A lady right back here has got an asthma. They're missing it. Went right over top of that lady and turned black as it could be right over because she never heeded to it. See, it turned right black and muffin come over like that. She failed it. Oh, Lord God, do something. Help. I pray, Lord. Don't give them something that will shake them, Lord. Here, there's a lady sitting right out here in the row praying she's got asthma, asthmatic condition. Her name's Miss Lake. You believe with all your heart? All right, Miss Lake, stand up on your feet. I don't know you, but go home and be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Don't get scared now. If he knows Simon Peter who he was, he knows who she is, too. You believe? How about in this section? Back in you, you believe? A lady sitting here looking at me. Lights over the woman. She's got a diabetic condition that's bothering her eyes. That's right. She's got something wrong with her shoulder. It was caused in an automobile accident. Mrs. Ferris. That's your name, isn't it? All right, now you can go home and be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Do you believe? What about way back? Way in the building. Here, this man sitting back here with a red jacket on, praying for your friend. You believe he'll get healed? You do it? All right. Raise up your hand and say, you stand up for him, man. Right back here on the right hand side. One, two, three, four persons down. Stand up with a red jacket, praying that you're praying about your friend there. Believe with all your heart there. Raise up and accept the healing of your friend. Go home and find him well. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is still God. Can you say from this time, this time, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is here among you people. Now, will you with habits, you that's burdened down with something, will you come here and stand for a word of prayer? While you know that the Holy Spirit is here, I did that for one thing, for the glory of God, that you who wants to be delivered from your troubles, come down here and stand here. You that wants to know God as your Savior and wants to be filled with His Spirit, come down. All the Father has given me will come to me, said our Lord. All that the Father has given me will come. But no man can come except my Father draws him. And all that he draws will come to me. I'm speaking in his stead tonight. Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden. You shall find rest to your soul. Quit being flusterated and wandering about. You'll never be any closer until you meet him face to face. Well, remember, in the Bible, thus saith the Holy Spirit. He's in your midst. How can you doubt he's proved that his presence is here? Come, all ye now, that wants to find him as your Savior, wants to find pardoning grace for your sins that you've committed. Yet you want to love him. You want to do what's right, but never had the power to do it. Rise from your seat and come here now. 
I call you in the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that the Holy Spirit speaking in my heart, that indifference and prejudice and everything exists amongst the people. Come get that out of your soul right now. The canker will canker you. Love and sweetness is the only thing that God will recognize. God bless you, ladies. These people stand here weeping like babies. That's what God loves. Come ever soul of sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. Who can go from this building tonight and call God to any other sign that he ever promised that would be? Church member, lukewarm church member that knows no more than I've been a Methodist, Baptist, or a Pentecost, or a Presbyterian. You know God no more than that and never met him on those sacred sands. You don't know no more than that. I call you to the altar. And remember, at the day of the judgment, your blood's off my hands. You will never meet God in peace, never go to heaven until you're born of the Spirit of God with an experience that you know that something happened. And you might take some emotion, some intellectual conception, but you'll find that it fails when it comes to the end of the road. I mean the baptism of the Holy Spirit to meet God face to face. Then your life is changed. You're no more the same. Your life is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faith, goodness, mercy. That's what's in your life. While we sing slowly once more, so I'll be sure tonight we're going to start healing service. Come every soul of sin oppressed, my brother, if you'll card it for us. There's mercy with the Lord. Just let the singer now come forth, if you will. Come ever soul now of sin oppressed. The Holy Spirit giving an invitation to come lovely, sweetly bow. You might have seen the sick heal. That's true. We've had that for years. We've had that all down through the ages. But never did you ever see this to this age. And this is the last sign that God promised to his church as it was in the days of Sodom before the fire. How long was it before the fire fell? After that sign was done to the church spiritual, remember, it wasn't to the church intellectual, church spiritual. All right. Let us sing softly now, if you will. Come every soul of sin oppressed. Won't you come now? Some of the Christians now rise up. Ministers, come around these people who are standing here now. Brethren, Christian believers, would you be interested now in helping pray with someone that they might find the Lord Jesus dear to their soul? Move right up here close now and move around. Everyone now, while we're singing, let those who are Christians and interested in people getting saved. You like come and join prayer with them. Come now. Only trust him. Only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Only trust him, only trust him. Him only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Now let's all bow our heads, if we will. Brother David Duplissis, would you come here just a moment? While you're around the altar, each one of you now, while I, I want to give just a moment's instructions while the audience will be quiet just for a moment. 
I want each one of you to remember that God is here, promised himself. Here he appears before us tonight. Infallible proof that he's raised from the dead and is alive tonight in Phoenix, Arizona, Amen. in this Madison Square Garden. Amen. Listen to me, my poor friend. Listen to me, my brother and sister. He'll never be any more real till you see him coming in glory. He promises, and remember, he said, as it was in the days of Sodom, before the fire fell, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Watch exactly. Now, this is a church spiritual, although it's dying, you see that, and that's predicted to be that way, but it would receive its last message by the same sign that appeared at Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you understand? That makes the Holy Spirit right here now. Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. Now, a gift that's sent to the church will never operate unless somebody is out there to operate it. Gifts are not operated by random. It's operated by the power of God. Amen. And the power of God in your life brings the power of the Lord to me to speak to me and tell me those different things. I Amen. know none of those people. Ask them. Amen. Whatever happens, I know nothing about it. Praise There's no contact at all. I've just come in here tonight and sat down. Many of those people, wherever it was, raise your hands right now. Ever who was called, if you're still in here, ever who you was, and I didn't know you, and you know I don't know a thing about what was said, would you raise up just to prove to people that it's right? Ever who I was taught, ever who was called out? Somebody back in here was called out, wasn't it? Yeah, there's one, two, three, four, five, five, six. Six that I know standing right here still in the building that raises their hands and I don't know them, know nothing about them, as far as I ever know, never seen them in my life. But it just keeps revealing, speaking. That's exactly what Jesus said would take place in this day just before the fire fell. Got her hands in Russia to go up to you and bring it down. Judgment upon the nation. Another Nebuchadnezzar, another Babylon fixing to take over the place exactly what God predicted would do. For he put in the hearts of those people to bring revenge upon the earth, to take the revenge of the blood of the saints that died. We are here. We're at the end time. Friend, don't notice me, because I'm just a man. There's nothing to me, uh, just, uh, just a Christian. But it's the Holy Spirit that you're working to prove himself here. Remember, he's here. Now, you believe it with all your heart. Tell him right now that you believe that he's here. His presence has called you. And you want your sins forgiven. You want to be his servant. Be sincere about it. Raise up your heart to God and believe it. And you'll go away from here tonight meeting God on sacred grounds that you'll never be able to shake away from this. And you'll say from this time on, you met God. Now let's all bow our heads for prayer. And I'm going to ask my good brother David Duplessis here to lead this audience in prayer while we bow our heads.